Welcome to Transform Now, the podcast brought to you by robotic process automation pioneer, SSNC Blue Prism. Digital transformation has the potential to reshape the way companies service their customers, engage their employees, and manage their operations. Whether you're looking to develop strategies, tactics, or best practices to positively impact the future of work, or you're curious to see how other companies have successfully navigated their digital transformation programs, then this podcast is for you. We're here to help you transform now. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Marchuk. Welcome to the Transform Now podcast. In this episode, I'll be chatting with Diana Bikbaeva, who is a senior associate attorney with Mar- Marashlin and Donahue. She advises technology, telecom, and digital media startups on how to navigate complex business, regulatory compliance, and intellectual property law matters. We're going to be chatting with Diana about an article she wrote in February this year that outlines some very sticky subjects as it relates to AI, training data, fair use, and liability. I know this is a bit of a tangent from our typical content, but I think this is super important for everybody who's trying to plan out their AI strategy. So welcome, Diana. Thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate it. It's a to be on your podcast. I am so happy that you are here. Now, remember, you're, you're talking with a, a non-legal guy here. So can you tell me a little bit more about what you do and how you get in, into this sort of area of law? Absolutely. I got really interested in artificial intelligence and uh, its legal implications back past November when the news about some of the class action lawsuits connected with uh, generative AI models started appearing and when ChatGPT went viral and I got really interested in how it can all play out from the legal perspective and I felt like this is something very important for society artificial technology artificial intelligence technology and I was very curious and I couldn't find any answers online on how exactly some of the areas of law would apply to AI use cases. So I decided to dig in myself and do some research. And I thought that the results of my research might be interesting to other people. So I decided to write some articles about it. And here we are. They were definitely interesting. That is for sure. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you to start from maybe a base level. So some everybody on our listeners can sort of get a better feel for this. We start talking about um, copyrighted material and fair use and that sort of thing. Um, why is it such an important issue that we need to understand that these basics here before we start jumping into how we training models and image generation models are using this data? Uh, certainly. So bear with me because this is a loaded question and I want you to give you proper context. And by the way, copyright is just one of the legal regimes that may be implicated by uh, different AI use cases. Uh, but this is something that I wrote about. So let's start. First of all, Copyrighted material is um, anything that is subject to copyright. And copyright is a type of uh, intellectual property right that protects original works of authorship fixed in a tangible form of expression. Simply speaking, it's anything that is somewhat creative, that is not a mere idea, but is fixed in some tangible medium. For example, on paper, on a hard drive, on a server, on film, etc. Most of those things can be subject to copyright. And copyrighted material can take the form of songs, video recordings, paintings, novels, computer source code, building designs, etc. And copyright grants its holders a monopoly to do certain things, to make copies of their works, to make derivative works based on their copyrighted work. So for example, translations, summaries, collages, some musical arrangements, etc. Then the copyright also gives its holders the right to distribute copies of their works, to perform and display them publicly. A copyrighted holder can prevent anyone else from exercising their exclusive right to their works, or copyright holders can also license those rights for a fee or on some other terms. And copyright doesn't last forever either. In the U.S., for works created after 1977, it lasts the lifetime of the author plus 70 years. So when the copyright lapses, the work enters the public domain, meaning that it is not uh, subject to copyright anymore. But speaking of generative AI, 
Copyright is important in its context because many models were trained on copyrighted works and the authors of those works feel robbed of their labor and to make copyright infringement claims. There are currently more than seven copyright infringement class action lawsuits filed against big AI companies by different authors of copyrighted works, by novelists, by artists, like digital artists and computer programmers. And an important issue is that it is not quite clear yet if training or using AI models, generative AI models, infringes on copyright because this area of law is still in development. And as I said, there are cases and courts nowadays where we expect the courts to weigh in on uh, some of those more uh, granular, granular questions. It is important to say that AI models are not one size fits all. And the analysis that we will attempt here must be conducted in each particular case. And this is not legal advice, so this is just general information. First, copyright must be registered with the U.S. Copyright Office. Second, the work must be copyrightable, meaning that it's, it must be minimally original and creative. It must be created by a human author. We know a case where courts denied copyright in the photo made by a monkey, for example. Finally, for the copyright infringement case to be viable, at least one of the exclusive rights that copyright grants uh, must be violated, meaning that there must have been an unauthorized act uh, of copying a copyrighted work or creating a derived or some other rights must be violated. They m must be exercised without the consent of uh, the copyright owner, owner. And if, and, and here is where we need to start our analysis um, of whether generative AI in, at its machine learning stage infringes of, on copyright, because we need to understand how technologically machine learning takes place and whether copies of copyrighted material are being made, for example. And that is something that needs to be investigated in each particular case. And so far, it is not clear. But copying can be also proven by uh, direct or cir circumstantial evidence of copying. And uh, circumstantial evidence may include proof of AI models access to the copyrighted work and a probative similarity um, between the copyrighted work that was included in the training data set, for example, and the AI output. And so far, I have only seen one way that access can be proven. There is a website called uh, Have I Been Trained, which allows one to find whether a particular image was included in the Leon 5B data set that is used by some of the major image generating AI models. But then there's also something that's known as fair use. Can you give us an insight of what fair use is? The purpose of the fair use doctrine is to balance the rights of copyright owners and the benefits to society if the copyright is technically violated. For example, it can be fair use to copy portions of copyrighted works for the purposes of critical commentary, parody, news reporting, and research. And fair use is a very flexible doctrine that adapts to any use cases and technology. And its criteria include uh, the purpose and character of the use, including whether it is commercial, transformative, and non-expressive. Then the nature of the copyrighted work is important. Some works may be subject to a so-called thin copyright. So if they're not, if they don't have such a great degree of creativity, for example, they're subject to a thinner copyright. More can be allowed uh, with regard to such works for it to be fair use. Then the amount of, and substantiality of the portion of the copyrighted work used is also important. And finally, 
the effect of the use upon the potential market for or value of the copyrighted work. And here is something that may apply to a fair use analysis with regard to generative AI models, because some of those models may produce output that is in the same medium as the training data. For example, they may be trained on images and output images, which may have an effect on the potential market for images, for paintings, for digital artworks. That is one of the criteria that will be considered by courts. So with all this data that is being used by these AI models that are publicly available, so JetGPT is publicly available, we can sign up and use it. The same thing with Lambda and some of these other models that are available through Google and Meta and, and others. How can I ensure that the data that was trained on those models is not uh, affected by these copyrights or licensing restrictions that could limit or affect my distribution or use of that model? That is a great question. And it is important to see the terms of use and any documentation that vendors of those AI solutions can provide. It is also potentially possible to inquire from those vendors what their practices are, how they train to their models, whether they use licensed or public domain data, or perhaps they use their own synthetic data or their proprietary data as well. And if one comes to this question from the standpoint of a developer of AI models, I would say that it is safe to presume that much of the data available online is probably subject to some legal regimes protecting it, including copyright, data privacy laws, depending on the jurisdiction of the data subjects. So those people to whom this data belongs there's also rights of publicity, um, which protects the economic interests people have in their own likeness. And we've seen a lot of models that make it appear that some text is being said using the voice of a celebrity or somebody else, right? There are also biometric information privacy laws that may apply to photo portraits of people and voice recordings as well, because voice can also contain biometric data. And as for copyright, the developer of AI models should consider making sure that there is no copyright infringement if they use the data from the technical standpoint, for example, that because the developer will know uh, what the technical details of the machine learning process are, they might use some advice from copyright lawyers, for example, to better understand in which cases the likelihood of infringement is less prominent. That is one example, right? Or one could use licensed data, public domain data, synthetic data, or proprietary data. And as for private information, it is always a good practice to obtain, obtain consent or make a proper notification. With regard to privacy laws, it's a little more tricky because there is no comprehensive Consumer Data Privacy Act in the U.S. at this time. So far, it is a patchwork of privacy law acts that either apply to different states, so residents of different states, or to different subject matter data. In the U.S., Laws generally allow processing of personal data by default. With limited exceptions, companies do not have to show a legal basis for such data analysis as required by the privacy laws of some other jurisdictions. But for example, under the Children's uh, Online Privacy Protection Act, verifiable pa parental consent is necessary before collection of personal data. And the Virginia, Colorado, and Utah, I believe, Consumer Privacy Acts prohibit processing sensitive data without consent. I wanted to touch upon mm -hmm. the different use cases of generative AI and how copyright may or may not apply to them. Even if we presume that the act of copyright infringement happened during the machine training process, 
depending on the use case of the generative AI model, it may be more likely than not that the fair use doctrine will kick in. For example, if the use of copyrighted material is transformative, meaning that it has a different purpose than the training material on which models were trained. For example, one could train an AI model to recognize sentiment using different voice recordings, or AI models trained on novels can learn to find grammatical mistakes in text, or models trained on emails can help predict what you want to type in your email. And that those cases are arguably transformative use of copyrighted materials because they offer a new functionality. And that is probably the most important thing to for businesses to consider when they're using those generative AI models. So when you if you have a situation where we have a model that perhaps is trained on 10,000 pictures of cats and you then use that model to generate another picture of a cat. Is that transformative enough? That is a good question because there are different opinions on that. Uh, on the one hand, one could argue that the model is trained on images of cats that the purpose of which is to make us happy by looking at them. Uh, or they may carry some aesthetic value. And if we train this model to create other pictures of cats, one could argue that the purpose of the output material is the same. So it invokes some good emotions, it has an aesthetic value, and we don't have to hire a photographer to take pictures of cats anymore, or oh, we don't have to hire uh, an artist anymore. That is one point of view. Another point of view is that by creating an AI model, is developers already um, added a transformative purpose to this model because its purpose is to use the patterns found in the different images, figure out the weight of different parameters to produce new material and to produce some economic value for society or to enable people who would otherwise not be able to produce those images to be creators. And so if you take that example, it, it, we're not just generating a picture of a cat. Perhaps I want to generate a, a picture of a cat wearing a top hat. Now I've right. gotten multiple models or multiple training data that's involved, one containing top hats, the other containing cats, and now it's creating this transformative picture of a cat wearing a top hat. Would that be considered transformative because of the way that it's being used? I feel like the answer would still be similar to what we discussed a little earlier. So it is not clear yet. Okay. I feel like tech companies may have an upper hand in that they understand their technology and they can argue how the law applies to their technology and that, for example, there is no copying taking place and that the use is transformative. However, other factors that are also important for the analysis of fair use include whether the use is commercial. And here, research institutions creating AI models or compiling data sets, training data sets, may have a better case than big tech companies that have subscription business models and the use is commercial in that case. Gotcha. So... If we're using these AI models within a corporate setting, what are the potential liabilities or damages that we could face if the AI model infringes on these rights? This is a great question. I need to preface it with saying that if we're talking about copyright, for example, infringement with regard to generative AI models may take place at two levels. First, at the machine learning stage that we have discussed before, and second, at the stage where when we have an output and we use that output in the world. Liability, at least, I, I'm not sure yet how this will play out, but it seems less likely that 
end users will be uh, implicated uh, because the machine learning stage infringed on somebody's copyright. But it is not quite clear whether the end user will be liable for using an output of a generative AI model that is very similar to a copyrighted work or that defames somebody. As end users, we need to be cautious and use generative AI outputs with uh, a lot of caution and try to make sure that they don't infringe on certain rights of people and of authors and companies. So based on that, so it's, it sounds like there's still quite a few areas where we're still a lot in the gray. There's not been any specific legal precedents that have given direction to say that this is truly permissible or this is not permissible based on the current technologies, and the current uh, use cases that have, that have come forth. It sounds like based on what you're saying, a lot of these things really need to be tried in court to get some kind of precedent to be able to set it and say, this is what the law really means by that, given this context. Is that fair to say? Right. So how can we make sure that we're complying with all these these laws and regulations in a way that um, it's, it's, it conforms to the data protection laws, the uh, consumer protection laws, ethical standards. How can we do that without running the risk of non-compliance? First of all, I would say that when developing or using disruptive te technologies, one is bound to take risks and they may they be well-informed and calculated knowing the applicable legal frameworks um, and learning those from somebody who understands the legal regimes that may apply to uh, the use and development of AI models uh, is very important in uh, mitigating one's legal exposure. Then when choosing vendors, it is advisable to go for solutions that are explainable, going for vendors that can explain how their models work and what data was used and that their practices are ethical, then we should, we, the users of AI models should have AI governance and use policies in place that will reduce the risks of our legal exposure or implicating somebody's rights. For example, um, one should not enter confidential information into public AI solutions. If AI is being used in high risk areas, such as uh, employment, so screening applicants, for example, one should make sure that, first of all, AI does not make decisions on its own and that there is some human oversight and that steps are being taken to counter any bias that can be inherent in those models because they're trained on biased data at the time. And for example, AI models can prioritize certain demographics over others. And yeah, that is just one example. And different research institutions and uh, government agencies uh, come up with um, artificial intelligence risk management frameworks. For example, uh, one was developed by the National Institute of Standards and Technology early this year. Uh, it is always nice to keep abreast of all the developments in this field to understand um, which practices one needs to have uh, in place. As for the risks of non-compliance, addressing your earlier question, one poss possible consequence may be civil damages, um, regulatory scrutiny and fines, depending on what kind of legal framework might have been violated. And it is not impossible that courts may order injunctive relief, for example, a ban on the use or distribution of certain technology. And of course, there are also doomsday scenarios, which we're all aware of being cautious in our use, but also hopeful. Obviously, again, we said this before, there's, this is ever evolving. If you were to give advice, again, this is not legal advice. <laughs> So don't use this as legal advice, this is entertainment only, or whatever you want to call it. But if somehow you were telling somebody, look at AI, where do you think they are least likely to run into issues 
versus where they may be most likely to run into issues. Is, because again, some of it's data related, some of it's bias related. Is there anything specifically right now we could say that this use of AI, this transformative use of AI is something that would be generally acceptable and very low risk in terms of the, the adoption within an organization? That is a great question. Thank you for it. I believe that these cases that remove the output and remove the purpose of the use of um, the AI model as far as possible from the training data may be least problematic potentially. Obviously, it is important that the, the system itself must be secure and um, that it does not spit out confidential information or uh, it cannot be reverse engineered to get to some personal data that is protected um, that was used in the training of the model. I understand that those things can be hard for end users to vet necessarily, but using AI for purposes that remove it as far as possible from the medium uh, of the training data can be can help mitigate some risks. And obviously, there are also ways to distribute risks in contracts, such as terms of use or other types of contracts, and being mindful of what one agrees to, what terms one agrees to is very important. It can be also a great idea to try and negotiate your own terms if you have that leverage. So that is also something to consider. With, so negotiate with the AI provider in these right. cases who have the model. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. It sounds like we've got a lot to be thinking about. We're getting AI and its usage. So let's, let's kind of shift gears and I ask you some more personal questions in terms of you, you're into AI, you're into law. Do you, what other things do you read besides stuff related to AI and the law? Oh, that is a fun question. I do have, I literally have a book on AI and law in my bookcase. Yeah, it's uh, AI for Lawyers by uh, Noah Weisberg and uh, Alexander Dudek. But genre-wise, I really like dystopian novels. Okay. The classic ones, like 1984 and The Brave New World. It's interesting to see some of the things that authors might have predicted in the world. I love reading about the different characters who have the courage to test those systems they live in and that have the courage to live by their truth in very adverse circumstances. Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess that goes into our, what we're just talking about. So if you're going to go plowing ahead with AI, you, you need to be able to understand what risks you're getting yourself into and maybe test the boundaries a little bit. I'm very enthusiastic about the new technology and I'm mostly optimistic about it. But as a lawyer and as a rational person, I do think that we need to be cautious, but it doesn't mean that we can't enjoy it. So that makes sense. That makes about. sense. That makes sense. Well, Diana, it was a pleasure speaking with you today about this. Like I said, it gives us a lot to think about as we are you know, all dabbling now with ChatGPT and other AI models to make sure that we are thinking before we're moving forward too quickly so that we understand the risks that we're getting ourselves into, but also understand that the uh, there's ways that we can mitigate those risks in, in positive ways to get the outcomes that we're looking for. So thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And it was a fun conversation. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to Transform Now. For more insightful discussions on digital transformation and more, check out our podcast channel where you'll find all of our previous episodes. And to make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. And if you like what you've heard, please leave us a review. For more information about digital transformation and the future of work, check out blueprism.com to learn how SSNC Blueprism's digital workforce is enabling enterprise transformation now.